Good evening. Welcome to our 2018 election forum series on WEFS and at FloridaToday.com. I'm Isadora Rangel, your host for this evening and Florida Today's engagement editor. Tonight on stage, we're going to meet the candidates running for Florida House District 52, covering South Central Brevard areas, including Vieira, Century, Melbourne, Satellite Beach, and Melbourne Beach. There are two Republicans running in the August 28th primary. They are incumbent Thad Altman and Matt Nye. The winner of that primary will be facing Democrat Sita Begui in the November general election. Each candidate tonight will have one minute to answer my questions, as well as one minute for their opening and closing statements. They also get a 30-second rebuttal if their opponents brings them up. A reminder, they will not get a rebuttal in their intro and closing remarks. Our forum series is sponsored by Florida Today, Eastern Florida State College, and the League of Women Voters of the Space Coast. So let's move on to our opening remarks. The first one to go is Republican incumbent Thad Altman. You have one minute. Thank you. I'm uh, Thad Altman, your present representative in District 52. Um, I have a proven track record of conservative leadership. 24 years of representing the residents of Brevard County, either in the County Commission, the Florida House, and the Florida Senate. I think it's critical that we send somebody to Tallahassee that has the proven track record and the experience to be effective to represent our needs. The areas that I've been pro prominent in and spent a lot of my time, space program, where I was a Senate chairman of the Space Committee for six years, defense, my commensurate committee in space included defense. I've served on numerous education committees, including chairman of the Education Innovation Committee, and I've served on many of the key environmental committees as well. I was actually the sponsor in the House of one of the largest environmental legislations ever passed by the state of Florida. That was the Everglades Restoration uh, Bill, as well as the bill that spent uh, hundreds Thank of millions you. of dollars to help clean up runoff going into the Indian River Lagoon. Thank you. We'll move on to Republican Matt Knight. Good evening. Thank you for having me here tonight. I, my name is Matt Nye. I'm a resident of Sun Tree. I've uh, been there for about nine years now. I'm running for this seat because I'm tired of seeing career politicians take advantage of the system and the taxpayers for their own personal gain. Uh, Representative Altman has been in office in some shape or form off and on for the last 34 years. He's currently the beneficiary of a taxpayer-funded job that pays him $169,000 per year from the Astronaut Memorial Nonprofit Organization, uh, in addition to retirement benefits. I've done a public records request on his calendars, and I can tell you there's not a lot of activity on his work calendar. Uh, and I'm, I'm just very tired of seeing that type of abuse take place. And I'm running to go to Tallahassee as a citizen watchdog and try to clean that sort of thing up. Thank you. Thank you. Next one is Democrat Sita Biggie. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to Florida today and Florida Eastern College. And thank you to all of you for showing up today to hear this forum. My name is Sita Begui, and I am a mom, I'm a nurse, I'm an activist, I'm an author, and I have four children that went to Brevard Public Schools right here in Brevard County, Florida. My children also went to public universities in the state of Florida. I decided to throw my hat in the ring and run for state representative in District 52 after I saw 17 children murdered at Stoneman Douglas Ma Marjorie the High School. Marjorie, Stoneman Douglas Marjorie High School. I decided that I wanted to be a voice for our teachers, for public education, and for our children. And so I decided that one of us need to go to Tallahassee and stop looking at TV and getting upset, but go there and become an, an advocate and activist as well as do what it takes for children and for community. Thank you. We'll move on to our first question. Please give examples of bills or funding measures you would like to introduce if elected. Matt, you go first. So uh, in terms of bills that I would sponsor, uh, I think I would be looking at, you know, we just passed a record $88.7 billion budget uh, I, I would be looking at things to cut or tighten up as opposed to things to spend more money on. Uh, you've got a tremendous opportunity, you know, uh, health care is 40 percent of the budget, education is 21 percent of the budget. Uh, there are a lot of areas that currently the state uses what they call priority based, or excuse me, uh, uh, drawing a blank on the name, 
uh, what, what we need to get to is what they call priority-based budgeting, where you uh, review your priorities and, and prioritize appropriately. Um, so I don't have a specific bill that I would be going into, you know, from a spending perspective. I'm looking at ways to improve efficiencies and uh, reduce the size and scope of government. Sita, what bills would you introduce? The first bill I would introduce is to raise the minimum wage. I, I'm a talker. I love talking to people. And I hear stories from people, people that make $9, $10 an hour, even less. And they have to raise a family on that. And I want to go to Tallahassee so that I could look all the legisl legislators in the eye and say, tell me, how do you live on $10 an hour? How do you pay rent? How do you pay mortgage? How do you pay car insurance? How do you put gas in your car? How do you send your children to school? You can't. And so I think in order to, to do what I set out to do, which is represent the people and hear their issues and concerns, that I have to go to Tallahassee and I have to fight for them. And the only way to do that is to build the foundation for the family from the ground up by making sure people are paid a livable wage with benefits. Ted? First and foremost, uh, some additional legislation to help uh, protect the Indian River Lagoon and to restore it. Uh, we need to develop governance and procedures and laws to clean up the lagoon. So we have a lot of work still yet to do, such as shoreline restoration, additional dredging, um, ensuring that our agencies that are respons responsible for the lagoon are acting and giving them the tools to act. And then secondly, the space program. I've been deeply involved in a lot of space incentives, and we still have a lot of work to, to do that. Again, with some governance issues, some tax incentives, and the ability to continue to fund the talent that we need to remain and become uh, e an even greater uh, center of excellence for space flight. Thank you. Um, let's move on to school security um, and the Marjorie Stoneman High School Public Safe Safety Act, which was passed after the Parkland shooting and funded a Marshall program to train and arm some school employees. Do you support the program and why? Sita, you're going first. I support having a school resort, resource officer in every school. I do not support the Marshall Plan. I don't believe that teachers go into teaching so that they could carry a gun. I believe that we can find the funds in our budget to protect the most important resource, our children. And I believe that teachers, when given the opportunity to teach they will, when police officers have the opportunity to take care of our public and our children, they will. Thank you. Thad, you're next. I support uh, both those programs. I think it's important that we do everything we can possibly do to protect our children and give our teachers every tool that they feel comfortable using to protect our children. We have a lot of uh, educators that have the ability to be a part of a marshalling program. We need to have our school resources officers armed. Uh, it needs to be done in a very responsible way, and it can be done. I've been married to a school teacher for 25 years. Who would tell a teacher, if they're in lockdown and a shooter's entering their room, that we're not going to allow you to protect your children or yourself? I don't understand that way of thinking. We need to work with our schools and give them every tool possible. That's a last resort and hope it doesn't come to that. We need to prevent, but we need to cover all our bases. I strongly support that. Matt? Uh, I agree with Representative Altman. I think you need to have uh, all of the tools in the toolbox at your disposal. Uh, I'm for the Guardian program. I'm for school resource officers. Uh, I quite frankly think if you have a concealed carry permit, you should be able to carry on campus. Uh, I, it, to me, it's, again, it's uh, just fascinating that we leave our most valuable resources, the children, completely disarmed. Uh, so again, best case, the, to me, the more people you have uh, with concealed weapons that are properly trained, the better off you are. The problem with school resource officers, in an, just as a single solution, I'm in the technology business. In the technology business, we work to eliminate what they call single points of failure. A school resource officer, one per school, is by definition a single point of failure, and you saw what happened in Parkland when that single point failed. So I'm absolutely for uh, deploying all possible solutions to that problem. 
Uh, I want to ask you about the gun control provisions in the Marjorie Stoneman Act, which include a waiting period of three days for the purchase of a firearm, raising the age to buy a firearm from 18 to 21, and banning bump stocks. I want to know if you support those provisions or if you would like to repeal them and why. And Thad, you're going first. I support those provisions. I think when we were building consensus and addressing the school safety, um, we, we wanted to be broad-based, and uh, our children are being targeted. And one of the common themes that, uh, that we saw in some of these shootings, uh, they were all addressed in those three provisions. It doesn't mean that we might need to tweak some of them. For example, uh, we do allow uh, 18 to 20-year-olds to possess a firearm. They just can't purchase them. It could be that we could require additional background screening and training and perhaps give them the liberty to do that. And we already do that in some regards. If you're a police officer or a soldier, you can purchase a gun. So we might want to tweak that and, uh, and address that somewhat. But for the most part, the general scheme, I support uh, those provisions. I think they're measured. I think they're responsible. And I think in, uh, they don't in any way infringe on, on the Second Amendment. As a matter of fact, I think the greatest threat to our Second Amendment, our, our right to own firearms, is to not do nothing, and we continue to see the carnage, and, and then you fear a backlash. Matt? And I believe that is why I have an A rating with the NRA, and Representative Altman now has a C. Uh, so I do not support any of those provisions. I do not like the way uh, that bill was handled. I think the legislature should have taken the time to go to a special session. I don't think depriving 18 to 21 year olds of their right to purchase a firearm uh, will do anything at all uh, to impact uh, this phenomenon of these school shootings. And what we have to remember, uh, you know, everybody acted like there was this huge hurry, but these mass shootings in terms of more than five casualties in a Columbine style uh, event are very rare. There have only been 10 since Columbine in 1999, and, and they're obviously horrific and tragic when they happen. But the odds of somebody being killed in that type of school shooting are one in 641 million. So I think we could have taken the time to have a, specialist, a special session and craft some legislation that uh, would have been much more substantive and, and uh, better all around. Representative Alvin, you get 30 seconds for a rebuttal, if you would like. Yes, I th you know, we just could not kick the can. I mean, our children are targets, uh, and there's been carnage in our schools. It took a bipartisan effort, and probably one of the greatest achievements I've seen the legislature uh, achieve when you were two weeks toward the end of budget, end of session, we're two weeks away from recess, we had built the budget, and in that short period of time, we turned things around and appropriated $400 million to school safety. I personally met with parents of victims of that shooting. We had to do something, and I'm very proud that the legislature Thank did. You. Sita, your thoughts on the gun control provisions in the Marjorie Stoneman Act? I support the state legislature with the Marjorie, Marjorie Stoneman Act. Um, but when we talk about guns and we talk about control and we talk about reforms, we have to take in, into consideration we all watched television and we were helpless when we saw what happened in Aurora. We saw what happened at the Pulse nightclub. We saw what happened in Las Vegas. And I would take it one step further and try to add on more mental health funding. But definitely, I think the, the legislature did a good thing and I support the, um, the bill. All right, so my next question is still on this topic. If you were to rewrite this bill that the legislature passed after Parkland, what would you do different? Or what would you add to the bill? Matt, you're going first. Uh, I think I would have made the Guardian program, you know, the, the argument that I've heard from some of the reps that voted for this uh, were that they, they took the compromise with the gun control uh, to get the Guardian program. The problem is they made the Guardian program an opt-in thing instead of an opt-out thing. And so what you're seeing right now, to my knowledge, there are only two counties, I think it's Polk and one other, that have actually put into place the Guardian program. So. Uh, I would have come at it again. I think the Guardian program, the more people you have uh, carrying concealed weapons, the better off you are. Uh, so I would have made that and opt out, like that would have been a requirement for the schools and they would have to vote to opt out of it. Sita? I think there's a time and place for everything and I, I support the Second Amendment and I su support the people that want to carry guns. But I just think a school is not the place for it, except if you're a law enforcement officer. I think that we have to have people in Tallahassee 
that have common sense and will use their common sense when it comes to sensible gun reforms. So I wouldn't really add anything to it except, like I said before, I think we have to look at the, the entire approach and look at the mental health funding as well as put additional social workers in our schools. I am totally for reforms that are sensible and for the citizens having their voice in Tallahassee through me. Thank you. That? Well, I was there. I voted for it. I didn't offer any amendments to it. I think the product, given the time we had, was an exemplary pot product. So I really would not second guess it. I can't really think of anything that I would change. But I do want to highlight one part of the a bill that's overlooked that I think we need to focus on, and it will reflect the need to make changes or tweaks or improvements, and that's the special commission that we established to study what happened at Parkland and other school shootings and to see what we could do uh, to prevent that in the future and to make this bill uh, better. Our own Desmond Blackburn, the former school superintendent for Brevard County, is on that commission. So I'm looking forward to getting their feedback and to see what we can do. That bill only passed by two votes in the Senate and right down to the wire in the House, everyone thought it was going to die. It was a very, very tough bill and it, it required cooperation something you don't see a lot in government and legislative bodies anymore, where both parties came together and we worked together and did not have gridlock, and we, we passed a, a very important bill. So my next question is open-ended, but I want you to give me uh, specific actions that you would take if elected to help the Indian River Lagoon. Uh, Sita? Specific actions I would take. Um, I think everything starts with education. And oftentimes, you know, we, you're riding in your car with your children and you see uh, a garbage truck going by, waste management, and it says, think green, recycle. And I wonder how many parents actually take the time to teach their children what that means. So I would say we have to educate our public about what happens when a septic tank is leaking into the lagoon, what happens when you cut your grass and the clipping goes into the lagoon, what happens when you litter, when you're in your boat and you're riding around on the weekends and the next day your neighbor's picking up garbage. I think we need to look at it because not only does, does it affect our health, but it also affects our economy. So I would say education is the key to fixing the Indian River Lagoon. This didn't happen overnight. This happened, uh, took a long time to happen, and I think it would take a while to get all the muck out of the lagoon and educate our citizens about what we can do to make it more green, better. So I had specific actions to help the lagoon. Specific action, uh, more money for dredging. The single greatest problem we have in the lagoon now is residual muck that's been building up for 60 years from runoff, sewer treatment plant discharges. We must get that muck out, that's the most critical, the, 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 the most rapid thing we could do to clean up the lagoon. Secondly, uh, purchasing environmentally sensitive lands, that the development of those would have significant impacts toward the, uh, the Indian River Lagoon. We need to preserve that, those lands that help filter water and keep the lagoon clean. Uh, other uh, measures, shoreline restoration, uh, stronger laws related to uh, runoff into the lagoon, uh, hazardous waste, we need to look at our sewer discharges and requiring our cities and county to make sure that they fund the necessary sewage infrastructure because we're seeing a lot of, a lot of uh, sewage discharges, 800 million, dollar, 800 million gallons of sewage just recently in Titusville. Those are the, the things I can list in 30 seconds. Matt, specific actions for the lagoon? Sure, I think uh, first of all you go with the low-hanging fruit and go after these municipalities uh, when they dump raw sewage into the lagoon. You just had the incident in Titusville, close to 900,000 gallons. We've had uh, numerous uh, uh, situations like that with Satellite Beach and some of the other municipalities. So I think the first thing is uh, get the municipalities to upgrade their infrastructure, do what they're supposed to be doing, and take care of the infrastructure. Uh, second thing, low-hanging fruit, doesn't cost anything. For these cities, you know, they have these canals that go to the lagoon. Those canals fill with the debris and in order to clear that debris, they have to get permits from the St. John's River Water Management District. You could pass legislation to give them open-ended permits so they can go in and clean that stuff out before it ever even gets to the lagoon. Simple, again, doesn't cost a penny. Uh, and then the last thing is like in Melbourne Beach, you could look at putting them on a sewer system as opposed to the septic because in an area like that, you are, you know, the septic tanks are very close uh, to the lagoon and that could take some of the pressure off too. So lots and lots of options, a multifaceted problem. 
All right, and it's sort of a, a related question. Um, I believe Representative Altman brought up conservation, land conservation. Um, money for that purpose was set aside by voters in 2014 through Amendment 1. The legislature has used some of that money for other uses, such as operating expenses of state agencies, and that has actually caused a lawsuit brought by environmental groups. Um, what is your position on how the legislature has allocated Amendment 1 dollars, and what would you do personally as a lawmaker regarding this issue? Uh, Thad, you're going first. Well, I strongly support uh, Florida Forever, and I strongly supported Amendment 1. It basically restored funding for Florida Forever. We lost funding uh, for that program uh, after we lost Governor Bush, and uh, it, it, uh, it is a very popular program, and the people voted by 72 percent to bring it back, and the legislature just ignored the will of the people. I have been a strong advocate for it. I have ran amendments on the floor trying to restore the funding, and we haven't been successful. I'm very pleased that a court just recently ruled in our favor, uh, citing that we have not uh, implemented the will of the people. I hope the Supreme Court uh, does the same. And as a legislature, legislator, I'll be right there, uh, front and center, making sure that we, we fully fund that valuable program. Matt, on Amendment 1, has the legislature properly allocated those dollars? And how do you sure. So, uh, you know, first thing is, anytime you have a trust fund or an amendment like this, I think you should spend the money, uh, keep the money in the trust fund and spend it for what it's supposed to be or, or spend it what, for, for what it was intended. Uh, what a lot of people may not realize is that between local, state, and federal government, 30 percent of the land in Florida is already owned by government. So I'm not sure we need uh, more government ownership of land. Furthermore, when the state buys land, not only is there a purchase and acquisition cost, there is an ongoing maintenance cost. So if we're talking about how do we keep taxes low and uh, set priorities, you know, maintaining all of this land doesn't seem like a, a great idea. So a solution to that is use what they call conservation easements, where the owner actually maintains the land. Uh, the purpose is achieved because they're not allowed to develop the land but the cost of maintaining it isn't on the state. It stays uh, with the owner. So those are just some, uh, some, some of my thoughts on Amendment 1. Sita? Can you repeat the question, please? Sure. Um, um, OK, so um, money for land conservation was set aside by voters in 2014 through Amendment 1. The legislature has used some of that money for other purposes, such as operating expenses of state agencies. And like I mentioned, there's a lawsuit involving that, um, a lawsuit against the legislature. Um, what is your position on how that money is being allocated right now, and what would you do personally as a lawmaker regarding this issue with Amendment 1? Well, you know, uh, groups like the Sierra Club and Forever Florida, um, they're always working together so that we can keep Florida beautiful. We want to bring tourists here. We want Florida to look good, and we want to have open spaces where people can appreciate Florida. The misappropriation of funds is something I don't support, and I think we need to look at our environment, not just when we talk about the Indian River Lagoon, but when we talk about land and conserving land, there's, there's a reason why people want to conserve the, those lands. Usually it's something to do with maybe the, the habitat, what's happening with wildlife, what's happening with our rivers and lakes, land surrounding that, and sometimes it's because we don't want people to build on those lands because there's an issue with what's going on, like exactly what's going on with the Indian River Lagoon. So I think we need to pay attention, and first, first thing I would do if I get to the state legislature, when I get there, is to make sure that funds are appropriated for what they, we said it was gonna be appropriated for. Thank you, and on a similar topic, uh, I wanna discuss septic tanks. Um, Brevard has a plan to convert um, septic tanks to sewer in a lot of places, uh, but Brevard, like many counties throughout Florida, um, doesn't have enough money to do that uh, as fast as they wish. What do you think the legislature should do in terms of funding for septic tank conversions? And would you ever support a ban on septic tanks such as the one in the Florida Keys right now? Uh, Matt, you're going first. Uh, in regards to the ban, only in, you know, it would depend on the distance, right? Again, so if it's Melbourne Beach or an area like that, possibly I could see supporting a ban, maybe. Again, the solution there is to go to a sewer type system. Um, I'm sorry, what was the rest of the? And uh, in terms of how would you uh, approach, um, do you support more funding from the state legislature for septic to sewer conversions? 
Uh, I, w I would, yes. I think that's uh, an appropriate, again, infrastructure to change that type of thing. Again, it comes down to the distance. You know, I'm not sure uh, septic tanks on the other side of the St. Johns River are an issue uh, in regards to the lagoon. So. Thank you. And I think let's go after the low-hanging fruit, the municipal, you know, going back to, again, return on investment and where, where is the most damage being done, municipalities dumping millions of gallons of raw sewage into the lagoon. That's the priority in my eyes. Sita, what, what should the legislature do regarding septic tanks, and would you support a ban in certain parts of the I state? I think the current moratorium that we have with septic tanks is fine, but I do, I would support a slow process where we can convert septic tanks to sewer. Um, I see no, I mean, when, when sometimes when we look at what's happening with our tax dollars, we have so much money um, to send overseas. We have money that we give to other countries, to other nations. We have so much money that we can give for wars, but we don't have enough money to convert our septic to our sewers. I find um, that, that that's something that I would look into and I would ask the federal government to come in and help the state as well. I, I don't think we can do all the septics, but I think it's something we should work to forward, to look forward to doing. Ben? A, a total ban could be detrimental because what septic tanks do in your rural areas, uh, five, one unit to five acres or one unit to 10, uh, it provides the ability to, to, to live without a lot of density. As a matter of fact, uh, we've seen the negative impacts that public sewer systems can have on the lagoon with the spills, and they also drive very high dense development. So uh, they play a role. The key is that they are done properly and they're properly maintained and are inspected. Certainly in high dense areas, you shouldn't have septic tanks. The legislature did pass a bill that re required uh, inspections required fees for those inspections and required uh, and developed a fund to improve and uh, repair those broken sept septic tanks without the public having to pay. It was, it was paid for that broader base fee. Uh, that, the public wasn't ready for that and we, we repealed that. But I think those are the kind of programs we need to go back to the drawing board. Technology will be another solution. I run out of time, but, but I think that Thank plays you. a key role. Uh, my next question is, is, do you support abortion rights and how will you ensure that low-income women receive information about all of their reproductive options? Sita? I do. I support a woman's right to choose, and I support, I, I think in the, that at the appropriate age, we should be making sure that we have the information. Oftentimes, we see people make decisions for women, but I believe that our bodies and our reproductive rights is something that I personally, as a woman, I take personally, and I think I don't want to see anybody interfere with Roe versus Wade. I think that um, sex education at the appropriate age, as well as an academic and a trade and vocational is great for women, but when it comes to abortion rights, I would say I, w I don't want to be touching that. Ben? Well, I was very honored to co-sponsor House Bill 41, which funded crisis pregnancy centers. So women and the most, and one of, one of the most difficult times of their life trying to, to find the support to have a child can get the support to bring a human life into the world. I think there's no greater thing anyone can do but to, li to literally bring life into the world. I was shocked that we had uh, opposition to that, but I, I strongly support um, the, I strongly support for the right of us who believe that life begins at conception to advocate for that and to provide the resources to help women bring a life into the world. So I am pro-life. I believe, believe that life begins at conceptions and abortion should not happen unless there's severe, severe uh, situations such as the life of the mother, incest. Now, those are the things that I think uh, are the only exceptions to that. Matt? So I am pro-life. I do believe life begins at conception. The issue I have is that I don't see uh, government interfering uh, with a woman's health decisions. Again, if we're going, if we're talking about, uh, you know, the pregnancy being a risk to the actual woman's survival, uh, that's where things get uh, murky for me. So uh, I don't see government having a role in that. Uh, in regards to making resources available to, I think you said, low-income 
uh, pregnant women, it sounds like that's already in place and I would support it as it is. Sure. Still on the topic of health care, um, if elected, would you plan to support legislation to obtain Medicaid expansion dollars for the state of Florida or anything similar to that as was proposed a couple of years ago? If not, how would you, provo how would you provide access to health care for low income, income employees who do not qualify for health insurance under the Affordable Care Act? Thad, you're going first. Well, I support bringing back our tax dollars to the state of Florida. And we pay a lot of taxes in terms of Medicaid and Medicare. And, and what uh, the expansion of Medi Medicaid uh, eligibility does, it brings back our money. And it allows us to really help meet the health care crisis that we have in this state. So I support that. I support it, though, only if we spend those dollars in a wise way, uh, having private providers, uh, not allowing freeloaders, or those who are just simply uh, gaming the system, but to require them to seek jobs or workforce training if they are receiving that Medicaid expansion. But this is our money, and to turn that dollar away, $54 billion we turned away, I think that's malfeasance. I think we need to bring those dollars back here so the people of Florida can get the health care they need. Matt? So I absolutely do not support the expansion of Medicaid. Uh, you know, if you look at the industries that are have the most issues, the ones that we have the most problem with, they are the most heavily regulated by government. So insurance, health care, all of the things that we're always talking about, the problems are created by government intervention into the marketplace. The solution is to get government out of it. We need to cut costs. We need to find ways to streamline efficiencies, cut costs with the Medicaid program. That's 40 percent of our state budget. Uh, we need to find ways to improve the business environment so that we don't have people that need the Medicaid in the first place. So if we improve access to health insurance, again, implement free market reforms, so allow the market to work so that people will have access to affordable insurance and health care, the keys are, uh, you know, again, transparency, competition, uh, not more uh, government handouts. Sita, your thoughts on Medicaid expansion? I support Medicaid expansion. Um, you know, we, we have people that can afford health insurance. Then we have people who have employer-sponsored insurance. And we have people who qualify for Medicaid. But then we have people that fall into the gap. And those are the people that I think we should expand Med Medicaid for. Unfortunately, not everyone can afford private insurance. I myself found myself in that situation recently when I decided to resign and stay home. And um, my insurance was about $800 a month for medical, dental, and vision. And so I went back to work as a nurse because I figured I'll just get my insurance at work. But I run into people every single day that the biggest issue is healthcare in addition to education and the environment. And for those people, I tell them, if I am your voice when I get to Tallahassee, I would make sure that we can have a state that put people before profits and that, yes, I will look out for health care for all. It is a, health care is a right. It is not a privilege. Thank you. When it comes to mental health funding, Florida ranks near the bottom among all 50 states. Do you support increased funding for mental health services? And please be specific on what kind of services you are referring to. Uh, if you support that. Matt, you're going first. So I would say yes, there's clearly a need for more mental health funding uh, in terms of the specific types. I think you would be looking at uh, increases in the number of beds in facilities like circles of care and things of that nature. Um, you know, there's clearly a cost to society when we have mentally ill people that are literally out on the street. Uh, I know I've been you know, to shopping centers and other areas, and it's just absolutely heartbreaking uh, to see uh, the way some of these folks are living uh, and are treated, uh, and in some cases, they're veterans. So, yes, absolutely, that's a gap that needs to be filled. Thank you. Sita, your thoughts on mental health funding and what kind of programs would you fund? I think mental health funding, it's, it's, a, it, that's a, it's, a, it's a question that I can't answer it in a minute, but I will try. The foundation for family starts in the home. Unfortunately, we see nowadays, we see so many people don't feel good about themselves. We see so many people with self-esteem issues and bullying and people use words that they should not be using 
but of disrespect. They speak to others as though th their life has no value. And unfortunately, these are all little things that contributes to how people feel about their mental health. I would say that we need to increase mental fun health funding, and we need to have more facilities, not just a facility where you can take someone if they're Baker acted, like circles of care. We need to have places that people are trained to take care of the mentally ill, and they should not be putting people in prison if something is wrong. Oftentimes, as a nurse, I have a lot of friends that work in the prison system, and we lock people up who have mental health problems. What we need is more beds in the community and more Thank compassion. You. And when people say that they're pro-life and they're pro-family, prove Thank it you. by passing legislation that helps Thank these your, people your time as well. Is up. Uh, well, I, I do agree. We do need to provide more funding in mental health. I think it's money well spent, and it will prevent a lot of tragedies, both uh, personal and collective tragedies. And one of the things we did in the school safety bill that we passed, we put over $60 million into guidance counselor mental health counseling, counseling in our schools. It was sort of ironic. I met with us, a group of uh, Brevard County students, and they were lobbying the legislature on what they thought was most important in terms of fu a funding need in our schools. And it was mental health counseling, uh, unequivocal, without question. Our, our kids know what's going on in our schools and our community. So I do support that, it's important. And I hope we continue that, uh, that trend that we set during the school safety bill. Thank you. Um, let's move on to education now. Um, I want you to name uh, what are the biggest issues facing education in Florida today? And what would you propose in terms of fixing those issues? Sita, you're first. I, I think when we, when we pay our property taxes, I mean, I, uh, of course I know, I would like to see my taxes go to public education. I feel like we take too much money out of public education and we put it in play, in, in, it's a misappropriation of funds. I would like to see teachers being paid what they're worth I would like to see more benefits for teachers. I would also like to see more academic studies offered, more trade. I would like to see partnership with the community so that people, so when our students leave high school, they're prepared to face the world, they're prepared to work. What do we want for our children? We all want a safe environment, we want a good education, we want good health care, and we want them to go out and be the best they can be and find a job with benefits. So I would say, Let's just increase the funding for schools and treat teachers with respect. It's not about taking the, the, our tax dollars for public education and giving it to private schools or charter schools. Thank you. Thad? I think the first thing we need to do is to give our teachers more freedom. Uh, we've, we've, we're micromanaging our educational system. We need to restore that very special relationship between our teachers and our students. And we also need to restore that relationship between our teachers, students, and parents. We need to give parents more choices. We went a long way toward that this last session. We, we can do more. And, and finally, I, I think it's important that we look at the ability to provide the resources to our school system. There are funding backlogs, and we need to make sure that we not only have the educational curriculum, but the infrastructure in place. And we're going to have a lot of infrastructure challenges as our population grows and as we look at the, the retrofit program to make our schools safer. But those are the three things that I see are the greatest challenges in our schools. Matt, biggest issues facing education and how to fix them. Sure. So according to the National Assessment for Educational Progress, only 35% of Floridian eighth graders are reading proficiently. Only 29% perform proficiently in math. This is despite the fact that we're spending $21 billion of our $88.7 billion a year uh, in educational funding. Uh, those numbers are staggering to me that that, that is considered acceptable. Um, I can tell you that all of the teachers I know are very warm, caring people. They're very competent and they want their students to succeed. So I definitely don't think the teachers are the issue. Uh, the funding I don't think is an issue. We're at record levels. Uh, fund funding of education has increased by 21% over the last eight years. So I think the problem is systemic. It's the bureaucracy. The funding is not getting to the classroom. It's being absorbed in the bureaucracy. We've got the high stakes testing. Again, teachers aren't allowed to customize uh, to teach to the individual. And we need to make sure the money gets to the classroom and not absorbed into the bureaucracy. 
Thank you. And the legislature in, in recent years has passed laws <clears throat> that force school districts to share capital dollars with privately operated charter schools, and they give $200 million for charter schools to open up close to struggling public schools. Do you support such efforts and explain why? Thad, you're going first. I do. Charter schools offer choice by our parents. Um, every school, right now, without charter schools, parents, unless they have the resources, are forced to go to a specific school in their neighborhood. And that may not work for them. A charter school is an option. Also, charter schools saves our public schools a lot of money. The charter schools do not receive anywhere close the amount of monies that our traditional public schools receive for funding. It requires innovation and the ability for that charter school to, to bring forth resources. So I support them. I think they're very important, not only for the students but that attend our charter schools, but it's important for all students. I think it will make our educational system as a whole better. They must be, have, they must be managed properly. The public school system must have the ability to provide oversight. Uh, we must have accountability. But I think all in all, they're a very important part of the, the solution to quality education. Matt, on charter schools? Uh, so I agree with all of that. I think anything that increases choice for parents, uh, that increases competition, again, I'm for market-based approaches. I know that uh, free public education is in the Florida Constitution, uh, but I absolutely think that charter schools uh, do an excellent job of providing uh, a, a good education at a much lower cost than the public school system. And uh, I think w w the data I was looking at the other day, our cost per pupil statewide is between $7,400 and $8,000, somewhere in that range. And I've seen figures for charter schools that are roughly a third of that, and their test scores are better. So uh, I definitely think that uh, uh, charter schools are, are uh, a, you know, that's, that's a valid piece of the puzzle. Anyth again, anything that offers more choice uh, is a good thing. Sita? I think there's pros and cons to everything, but I support public education. I think if we have money, we should be putting it into our public schools, paying our teachers more, making sure they have the benefits and giving them the tools they need to, to produce the best quality students ever. I often hear people talk about underserved communities. I hear them talk about choice and I hear them talk about competition. When a child leaves a charter school, they're going back into their own communities. So what do we do? We not only are we focusing on our public school, but we need to focus on our communities. Give parents the tools they need to produce children in school that are going to go out there and be the best they can be. And if the end goal is to find a job and contrib contribute to society, yes, that's what we want. But I don't like sometimes when it's, you know, people are saying, well, we, we, the charter schools are serving the underserved community. Find out why a community is underserved before you throw a child into a school that's not in their community. Because I think the community, the family, is where everything is. Some parents are working two jobs, and they can't be there to volunteer in their children's school. They can't be there to make the community school what it should be. So me, I see the biggie as a taxpayer running for District 52. That's what I want to do, empower parents, teachers, Thank and you. the communities. Thank you. Let's move on to the next question. Do you support the HOPE scholarship program, which allows car buyers to contribute their vehicle sales tax to fund private school scholarships for public school students who are bullied? And why or why not? Matt, you're going first. Sure. I support any of the programs like that where there's uh, 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 the ability to direct, if you will, uh, the proceeds. Uh, to a particular uh, group of individuals, absolutely. And why? Uh, I just think it's, you know, obviously uh, it, it's a good thing. So uh, there are other, I want to say there are other types, I'm drawing a blank on the names, but I know there are different, some other different programs in addition to that, so. Yeah. Sita? I mean, it's, it's, it's a good idea in theory, um, but we already have the Bright Future Scholarship. We already have a merit-based scholarship. If a child is being bullied in public school, why don't we find out what's causing the bullying? I think, you know, as a society, we've become a nation of sometimes bullies where people use code words against people who are different, whether it's the LGBT community, whether it's an Indian like myself, whether it's somebody with different color, skin, or religion. We have to get back to where we respect each other. 
And so, it, yes, it's a good idea, but at the same time, let's focus, why is somebody being bullied? Why is somebody showing up late to school? Why is a child not learning? Find out the environment in which that child lives and what we can do to make it better. I think we can, society would benefit from all of us just maybe looking for different solutions. Maybe we need more social workers in our school. Find out what's happening and sit down with that child and the family and try to come up with a solution. Money is, does not fix everything. Sometimes you just have to sit down with someone and communicate and find out what's going on in their home and their community, and then you can find the answer to it. Fed? You know, I've personally met with parents who had a child that were bullied in a public school of their district, and I made effort after effort after effort to resolve the situation and put yourself in that parent's position where they know their child, for whatever reason, is being targeted. And without a program like this bill that allows parents to, to get support to find another school, they're trapped. I think it's a wonderful piece of legislation, and I think it's going to help a, a lot of kids. Bullying takes many forms in today's world, through cyberbullying, uh, bullying for, for a host of different reasons, just the way a, uh, a child dresses or acts, or, and a lot of times because they're successful, a lot of highly academic children are bullied. So I think it is important that we give those parents the choice to get their children out of those horrible situations. Thank you. Many counties and cities in Florida prohibit discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender, gender identity. Would you support a state law to address discrimination based on gender identity or sexual orientation? Why or why not? Sita? Yes, I will support a law like that. I think everyone has the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I think anytime you infringe upon that right for an individual, it's not a good thing for America. We're all Americans. This is the America that I wanted to come to. This is the America that I immigrated to, where everyone can dream and everyone should have the same opportunity and no one should be discri discriminated against. You know, oftentimes I have to cradle patients when they're dying in hospice. And when they're, when they're leaving this planet, they don't ask you your gender. They don't ask you if you're gay. They don't ask you if you're straight. The, what they want you to do is they, want, they ask you how am I leaving a better legacy behind for the people that I'm leaving behind? And oftentimes people discriminate against others for the wrong reasons. I think we all need to take a good look at ourselves and recognize at the end of the day, we're all human beings and we're all here on God's magnificent planet for one reason and one reason only. Find your purpose and Thank you. I believe that service to God is service to mankind. Thank you. That would you support a state law prohibiting discrimination against the LGBTQ community? I think, to a point, I, I think discrimination can be a very ugly thing, and everyone should have the right to pursue uh, freedom and happiness in this great American system. But what we've seen in, in recent years is a desire to inflict some views that uh, affect other people's rights for example, the right of freedom of religion. Um, there's efforts to require churches to hire individuals that have a lifestyle or a set of beliefs that are contrary to their religious beliefs. I think that's wrong. I think we need to preve prevent that. That's why I supported and co-sponsored the Freedom of Religion Act, was to pr protect our churches and faith-based schools uh, from other organizations that are people that have beliefs that are different. We need to respect those beliefs, but we also need to respect the faith-based community that may have different beliefs. So I think it has to be measured and balanced. Matt? Uh, no, I would not support that type of legislation. Uh, you know, Americans are supposed to be equal before the eyes of the law. That's why the statue of Lady Justice is blindfolded. Um, I have uh, relatives and friends that are gay. I know uh, many of them have suffered over the years because of the intolerance of others. Uh, but having said that, I don't think you can create uh, special classes of citizens uh, uh, when it comes to that type of thing. So I would not support, while I'm uh, very sympathetic uh, to some of the suffering I've witnessed uh, and, and, you know, in a, a private setting, would not tolerate it, but I don't see uh, passing legislation to that effect. And are you in favor of automatic restoration of felons' right to vote once their obligations have been satisfied? If not, what is your position in regards to this issue? Thad? 
I would not support that for violent criminals. Uh, I would not support it for sexual predators, violence against children. I think there are cases where uh, uh, people have committed felonies uh, and, and some m smaller, less uh, intense crimes that probably we need to look at in restoring some of those civil, uh, civil rights. So a blanket, no. But uh, I think we have, one, far too many felonies. We have uh, alienated a big block of our, our population. Uh, a lot of youths do silly things, uh, maybe at the wrong place at the wrong time, a nonviolent crime, and for the rest of their life, they're label, labeled as a felon and can never vote or, or, or care, have uh, certain types of employment. So I think we, again, need to take a measured approach and to look at those situations where it's justified, but there are, there are cases where these individuals uh, that have committed these horrendous crimes should, should never have those rights restored. Matt? Uh, I echo those sentiments almost exactly. So yeah, in terms of nonviolent uh, offenders, uh, you know, right now there is a process in place where you can petition to get your voting rights back. Uh, this, uh, you know, the, I guess the one on the uh, ballot right now coming up is going to be to automatically make that an automatic type process. Um, but yes, I do think, I, I don't think because somebody made a mistake, and again, if it's a nonviolent crime, or as Thad said, somebody's in the wrong place at the wrong time, that they can never vote again, or they have to really jump through hoops uh, to do that. So, so yes, I would support, again, to, uh, if it's nonviolent, uh, to restore voting right, uh, Sita, rights. Sita, can you repeat it? These, these guys go on so long that I have forgot the question. <laughs> sure. <laughs> would you support restore, uh, restoring voting rights for felons who have fulfilled their obligations? Of course. Why and uh, why not? Yes, I do. Once you've paid your debt to society, of course, you should be allowed to get back, you should be able to get back in with your family, your children, get a job, be a part of function in society. You know, we all complain about children who have no fathers. We complain about the family unit that's breaking down. So somebody made a mistake, but they paid their price to society. As long as the courts and the law is that the person is released, why not? I think this is a socioeconomic issue as well as a, a foundation of family issue. People complain that they don't want to pay welfare and they don't want to pay for children and other people's children and they don't want to pay for health care for people. Well, guess what? If someone could come out of prison and, be, and have his rights restored and find a job and become a functioning part of society and take care of his family, I support it 100%. Thank you. Lawmakers have unsuccessfully introduced bills in recent years that allow the open carry of firearms and guns on college campuses. Would you vote for any of these bills if they were reintroduced? Matt? Uh, I would. So I'm for open carry. Again, all of the data indicates that the gun-free zones are the area where you have the issues with mass shootings and things like that, and in areas where you have concealed carry or even open carry, you have far less gun violence. So absolutely, I would vote for uh, any of those bills. I assume also on college campuses? Correct. Thank you. Sita? I, no, I would not vote for it. I, I again, I think um, certain places, you know, you can have a gun, but I, I don't agree with it on ca college campuses, and um, I don't support open carry. Okay, Thad? I support open carry in certain public places, and we already allow that if you're fishing or hunting, but I would not support it in our college campuses. Thank you. And what is your position regarding the availability of semi-automatic rifles, commonly referred to assault weapons, and large capacity magazine used for these weapons? Uh, please explain your position on this topic. Sita, you're going first. Um, I think if somebody wants to carry a, a semi-automatic or AR rifle that shoots you know, 10, 15 rounds, maybe more, great, join the military. I am a nurse. I work in long-term care. I have the privilege of taking care of our precious seniors. And I have to tell you, at the end of life, or when people are in their last 10, 15 years, no one is thinking about guns and who's shooting who and who's on welfare and who's having a child and, and all these kind of things. People are thinking about human life and dignity and what we can do to make the life of people a, a better life. So I would say if people want to shoot somebody, you, 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 have, the sec you have the right the second, with the Second Amendment to carry a gun, but to carry an AR rifle around in public, join the military. Thank you. Sen, your thoughts on assault rifles? Well, a, a semi-automatic rifle that, that represents many of the common hunting rifles. Um, 
it, um, I, I oppose banning the semi-automatic rifles, and many of the, the rifles that are called uh, assault weapons really are not much different than a regular uh, hunting rifle. I, so I would, I would not support a ban of those. Uh, we looked, th there were numerous amendments during the school safety bill to address that. When you really look at the, the problems associated with that, you literally would ha have to ban almost all rifles, including a common shotgun that uh, has more than one shell. So I don't, think that's, uh, I don't think that's a responsible way of addressing the problem. There are other ways, better background checks, uh, making sure that people who buy guns uh, are uh, qualified to have a gun. You know, I supported a bill that prohibited people with mental disorders from buying firearms. In this last school safety bill, we supported a bill that anyone who was dangerous to others or themselves could not have a firearm. Thank so you. I think that there are other solutions. Matt? So in addition to what uh, Representative Altman just said, uh, I want to zero in on the high capacity magazine thing. Uh, you know, a skilled shooter, first of all, a lot of these shootings are, are being done with handguns, uh, so, and, and those do not have, you know, super high capacity magazines. Uh, but a skilled shooter can change, eject a magazine and insert another one in a, you know, a second or in some cases less. And so the idea that this uh, banning these high capacity magazines is going to somehow reduce the lethality of these incidents, uh, I think is, is just not, not true. Uh, you know, I definitely don't support any sort of ban on uh, uh, semi-automatic weapons uh, for all the reasons uh, that Thad stated. It's just... Uh, uh, we have a right to bear arms, and those are, uh, you know, very commonly used rifles uh, for other purposes. So. All right, so we're running out of time, so we're going to move on to our closing statements. Um, I'm actually going to give you 45 seconds uh, to do your closing statements and your final uh, words to the voters. Asita, we're going to start with you, your closing statement, 45 seconds. If you want a person to represent you in Tallahassee that put value on human life, I'm your candidate. If you want a person who will represent you and take care of the environment, I'm your candidate. If you want a person who will be there for you for public education, I'm your person. If you want a person that will not go to Tallahassee and use code words and fear and hatred and fear mongering, I'm your person. My name is Sita Begee and I'm running as your representative for District 52 as a proud Democrat. Matt? So again, I'm running as a taxpayer watchdog. Uh, if elected, I will focus on prioritizing spending for things like infrastructure and cleaning up the Indian River Lagoon. I will not vote for things like red light cameras or Medicaid expansion uh, or, or bigger government in general. Uh, I will take a hard line on corruption. I'll tackle campaign finance reform. Uh, so again, if you want a watchdog looking out for the citizens of District 52, uh, I'm your guy. Thank you. Ted, you're the last one. Uh, let me talk about what I do when I'm not in the legislature, especially since my opponents tried to cast dispersions. I work at the Kennedy Space Center. I'm the only member of the entire legislature who works at our Space Center. My employees, my bosses, my board, my board of advisors represent some of the greatest heroes we've ever had. They've walked on the moon, flown hundreds of missions in Vietnam. They're family members of astronauts who've given their life. I have received sterling response to the job I've done. I've personally received awards from NASA for what we've done to educate future rocket scientists and astronauts. And we've actually um, saved the federal government and NASA a half a million dollars by bringing in private dollars to fund these programs. I don't get paid from a penny of taxpayers' funds, not a dime. Thank you all for being here. And that's a wrap up for our Florida House District 52 Forum. We'll be back after the August 28th primary on September 12th, where we're going to meet more candidates running for the Florida House. And don't forget to vote on the 28th. My thanks again to Eastern Florida State College and the League of Women Voters. I will see you in September.